Um, and I'd also like to apologise for the slight delay in the start time. For any councillors who are accessing this meeting remotely, a reminder that you are not counted as being present for the purposes of the Local Government Act 1972, and you may not vote on any matter under consideration. At the discretion of the Chair, you may, however, contribute to the discussion and participate in a non-decision-making capacity. All councillors are required to attend in person. Any member of the council can attend and make a request to the chair to speak or ask a question under normal rules. All future licensing committee meetings are scheduled to be convened at the town hall campus. This meeting will be live streamed for public viewing and a record of the decisions taken will be published after the meeting. I would like to, to remind members who are physically present and also those who may be joining remotely of the following protocols. Only speak when invited to do so by the chair. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand and direct all communication via the chair. For those, for those joining remotely, please ensure that your mics are muted when you are not speaking. Please use the chat function to alert of any technical difficulties. Please do not use the chat function for putting formal questions to the committee or to make other comments. Any persistent disruptive behaviour will result in removal from the meeting. I will now hand over to the Chair, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and welcome everyone to the Licensing Committee meeting Tuesday the 6th of September. 2022. Um, so we'll just uh, go through the agenda to start with. So apologies for absence. Apologies for absence. I haven't received any apologies, Chair. I've received apologies for lateness from Councillor Sizer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any declarations of interest for this evening's meetings? Any members to declare? No members. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting, um, pages 9 to 10. Um, are there any matters arising from those minutes that anyone wants to raise? No? Okay, moving swiftly on then to item four, um, which is the Licensing Service Annual Report uh, 21 and 22. Um, so I'll just pass you over to uh, Mr. David Tewitt. Thank you very much. Which one is it? Yeah. Hopefully, can you hear me? Um, so, thank you very much, Chairs. Just to introduce the annual report, um, my name is David Tew. I'm team leader for licensing and technical support. Um, we've, for the last few years, just presented an annual report to the licensing committee and also to full council, just sum summarising some of the statistics, um, uh, numbers of applications, etc., registrations received by the licensing service over the previous financial year. So I'll just run through the uh, report itself. Hopefully, members have it in front of them. I don't know if I can share my screen on this. Can I share my screen also? I join the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Would that be? Do Do any members need me to share my screen, or can they follow on? Uh, welcome to any members online. I can't see if there is. I'm sure I can't hear.
I still cannot hear. I'm not speaking just yet, Councillor. I've just. Uh... Uh, Councillor, there's nothing happening at the moment. That's why you can't hear anything. We're just trying to set up the uh, the um, screen. Okay, your sound is good. Now. Okay, I'll just I'll just whiz through this anyway. Um, so, first thing we tend to look at are the Licensing Act 2003 uh, applications and the correspondence received, uh, because that tends to be our uh, the function that that generates the most work for us. So, in terms of the numbers of licenses issued, premises licenses under Licensing Act 2003. It was, um, we noticed the trend uh, upwards trend from the previous year. So these will be licenses for pubs, bars, restaurants, etc., alcohol, entertainment, late night refreshment. Um, so the, the number of li licenses granted in the year was 92. Uh, minor variations, which are exactly that a minor variation, a minor change to an existing license. Um, you can see the statistic there. The number there was uh, fairly consistent with the previous year. Uh, just whizzing through variations to DPS. So, if a license authorizes alcohol sales, then there's a DPS. Um, the the if that person that person who's a DPS, if they change, then we get we receive an application for that. So the the numbers of those applications was up on the previous year. So I won't go into detail in all of these um, temporary event notices. So those are those are fairly. A contentious type of authorization, if you like. We receive quite a few of those in previous years. Um, as you can see, the number received in the year 2020 slash 21 dropped off considerably. So that was the year obviously most uh, impacted by the pandemic and the lockdowns that followed the, um, or as part of the pandemic response. And so, and we're, we're starting to see a recovery in those figures. Uh, but we're still some way short of what we would have seen in the, in the years uh, prior to the pandemic. And then just in terms of reviews, so review would be where an existing license or certificate exists and a person or an authority applies to for that to be looked at. So you can see there's a, a massive increase in the number of review applications in the previous year. Uh, the majority of these was uh, due to a significant proportion of expedited review applications. Uh, expedited reviews are power um, that only the police have uh, in, in circumstances where there's a concern about serious crime or serious disorder. So we had a, we had a significant number of those in the, previous, in the previous year. Won't go into those. Uh, personal licenses, again, this is uh, if an individual wishes to authorise alcohol sales. Um, <laughs> We've seen over the years a, a downward trend in, in those, but we've re reversed that trend in the previous year. And then subcommittee hearings. So um, obviously members will sit on various subcommittee meetings from time to time. Uh, we received, uh, a, a, well, we held a higher number of those in the previous year. And again, this is partly due to the number of expedited review review um, applications that had to be heard. So we're slightly up on the, on the number um, of subcommittee areas. I think it was 58 altogether. Um, feel free to stop me. So if you've got any questions on any of these Licensing Act 2003 type statistics, then um, by all means, just stop me and ask a question. Uh, so just onto Gambling Act. Um, Gambling Act. Yeah, sorry, David, there's one yeah. question just coming in. Uh, from Zoe. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wondered, maybe you don't have it to hand, but it's really interesting to see the kind of um, numbers that have come in, but I just wondered if we knew how many had been granted and refused, so for like the temporary events notices, have you got the, uh, I did find um, 
those for the licensed premises, the ones that had been modified or revoked, that's like in the, the appendix. But it, it would just be interesting to know what proportion of them. I know you do like everything possible to try and make them um, pass, but it would just be good to know how many of those temporary event notices are yeah, granted or refused. Yeah, I don't think we don't have that in this report. So that, that's something I'd have to essentially include in previous reports. So, Sir Councillor Garbett, we had this meeting yesterday. Uh, Sam, you were there. That our terms that actually 73% is it 78% of terms were actually approved, contrary to what many people think. I think it was just uh, uh, 14 percent, if I remember correctly, they were refused. Yeah. Ten. So majority of the tents were. I will look for the uh, details and put it to the chair. Yeah. Uh, so just on Gambling Act, there's a sort of long term trend in the number of betting licenses uh, that have, that we've seen over the last few years so uh, this this graph actually um, includes all sorts of betting gambling adult gaming centers bingo etc so but overall there's a there's a downward trend in uh, the number of premises in hackney that um, that persons can gamble in and that's that's reflected in this graph here uh, massage and special treatment licenses so these are uh, authorizations for uh, nail bars tattooists um, sauna steam rooms manicures pedicures etc so we saw a we saw a big fall in the number of applications that we had in uh, in the previous financial year and we started to see a recovery in those numbers and um, but we still think we're some way short of of where well we know we're, we're some way short of where we used to be so just just some work for us to do there to to get to get um get those premises licensed and uh, properly regulated and then i just uh, summarize some of our key projects we we were of course impacted in the previous year by uh, by various things by what we could do in terms of um officer availability uh, so we're, we're still working on digital transformation uh, we're, we're looking to um, reintroduce a, a, reg, a routine inspection regime and do some work on policy. So I've carried forward some of those uh, projects through to this forthcoming year. So we'll be looking at policy in the next um, over the next few months, licensing policy under the Licensing Act 2003. Uh, we're implementing our new database sales force, um, which we're hoping to. Uh, go live with, um, in various stages over the next few months and um, that inspection regime which i talked about and also the fees review so obviously um high high rates of inflation at the moment uh, so we're looking to where we can reflect those in, in the fees that we in the fees that we charge and then the last thing i have here is just the summary table which is just to summarize uh, some of those key numbers And that's it. Thank you, David, for that. Um, I'm sure there must be some questions out there in relation to this report. I mean, I, I've got a couple myself, um, but obviously I'd like members to come forward with any point of clarification or any kind of issues that you'd like to raise, if possible. I mean, okay. Councillor Garbett, you want to come in with a Thank you. This is really interesting. Um, just on table at point six, the planned activity for 2022-23, it mentions a significant efficiency saving. I just wondered if you could give us some detail about what that is. Um, and what's another one? Um, just how the fees review, and I know that the climate emergency is mentioned in some other parts of the report, but yeah it'd be good to know what can if the climate emergency and encouraging positive environmental behaviors 
are going to be considered in that as well. Well, in terms of efficiency savings at the moment, post um, IT problems, which we've had coming up to two years ago now, we're, we're, we're still having to do a lot of um, processes manually. Uh, so, for example, the temporary event notices, which we talked about, um, we get sent quite a few of those on a daily basis, and officers are having to do all of the, the data entry manually, um, take the payment, whether over the phone or uh, by sending that customer to, to make payment online. Uh, prior to that, we, we had an online form so a customer could fill it in, make the payment, and then it would come to us. Uh, so it's, it's things like that, the highly repetitive and quite, um, if you like, tedious processes that we should be able to automate a lot of, which will then create efficiency savings in that, in that respect. Um, and as another example, uh, public register, for example, we used to, a customer could go on our website and look for details of a, I don't know, their local pub, their local restaurant, et cetera, the hours, the activities that they had. Um, we've, we've not been able to host that online register for uh, approaching two years now. So, so that, those are the, so, so because of that, we, we tend to get queries, you know, what hours did I have? Can you send me a copy of this license? So and so so and so forth. So those sorts of efficiencies will, will manifest once we've got a new system up and running. And then in response to your other question about fees and so there's a there was a question about it's about encouraging positive kind of climate behaviors in relation to the climate emergency. I think it's mentioned somewhere else. So that is part of the kind of fees, but it's just if there's anything else being considered or that we can do. I'm not sure if it's in Samantha's report anything to do with climate, climate emergency or climate. We're, we're, we're slightly limited in what we can do in, um, in, in well, in some areas of licensing. Uh, I know Councillor Smith's uh, very keen on, on this as well. So uh, when, we're, when we're looking at policy, we're, we're, we'll, be, we'll be looking at um, how we can encourage um, sustainability and uh, things like that, but we're quite limited in what we can do in that respect. Any further questions there? I'm sure you have some questions. Somebody, come on. Council for Janet Thomas. Thanks, Chair. Mine is not a question, it's just to say thank you to David and his team. I'm aware of uh, not just myself, all of us are aware of the challenges around the cyber attack and data processing in the council, but they have taken uh, um, making sure that we have this data and we have this report. So just want to say thank you for the work that has gone to it. Thank you very much, Councillor Fajana Thomas. Um, and I echo those thanks to everyone. It's been difficult times. Um, I'm happy to ask a question if, if any, no one else has got a question. Um, so, just on page 19, David, in regards to the expedited reviews, um, or the, the kind of, you know, the, the reviews of premises licenses, obviously it's gone up, but can you just speak to that for a couple of minutes to say why you think that's the case? Because, you know, obviously doing the subcommittee hearing meetings, the, you know, the police are saying that things have changed out there. There's a different mood kind of going on. Could you just make some comments about that? And then just the final thing on page 23, um, look, sort of look back projects, objectives, digital transformation. Um, when do you think this might be all sort of sorted out by? and implemented by, roughly. Um, and then what does uh, implement new database selected by CSEBR? Could you just tell us what that is? Because I'm not sure myself, thank you. Uh, in terms of the expedited review, so certainly from police colleagues, um, we did see uh, a number of those review applications. I think the statistics are slightly skewed by the fact that one premises on Mayor Street had six applications, six um, review applications because it had three licenses. 
Um, so there were free review applications and then during that process there was a serious crime, serious um, incident which triggered the police to do to apply for expedited review as well. So, but if you were to take that premises out, it, it's still there's still a higher number of review applications um, in the previous year than that we've had in in other in other years. And I think it's just um, a reflection of what what was seen as the economy began to reopen and the nighttime economy uh, in particular began to reopen. Um, um, uh, noise and uh, crime disorder, etc. Can I just have a follow up there, if that's possible? Does, is that something that's wor is, is that a worry to you? Is that something that we should have our eye on the ball over? Uh, I wouldn't. Say, I think not so much a worry. A worry to to me. Uh, it, it's it's obviously something that we have to be prepared for. Um, I think if I, if there was one thing that I would worry about is the impact of on on colleagues, and in particular Amanda, because we we tend we tend to see review, um, appeals against review decisions, um, and I know that it impacts um, particularly on our colleagues in in legal just due to, due to the amount of time that that we have to spend on those. Um, on dealing with those, so uh, yeah, so not so much a worry. It's just a, it's a, it's like everything, isn't it? It's just a, it's a something we have to deal with and and resources to to be able to deal with it. Your second question about CSEB, CSEBR is our division, um, community safety enforcement and business regulation. Was it? Yeah. Well, information be complete. Yes, it's. Um, I think we're we're not where we are, would like to have been with this particular project. We thought we might be a bit further along at this stage, but um, we're hoping to go live in in phases. Um, what I should say is this is all of our service area, so it's not just licensing. Um, it's our colleagues in environmental health, environmental protection, enforcement, uh, traded standards, and some colleagues in in housing as well. Uh, so it's a big project, and we're all um, we're we're prioritising various um, uh, functions within a wider project. So so some phases will go live first, and then other phases will go live at later stages, depending on how we prioritise particular bits of work. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions out there? That's Anybody would like to raise? No? Okay. Um, great, we'll move on to agenda item five. Um, okay. Oh yeah, we'll just ask you to note that report, by the way. Yeah? Note the report you've just heard from David. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, item number five, uh, late night levy. Uh, presented by Samantha. Year five, quarter two and three. It's on pages 29 and 48. Don't know if you've managed to have a look at it at that. So Samantha uh, Mathis is our late night levy manager and uh, Samantha will be presenting this report. Chris, could you mute your... Apologies everyone, as we've had um, issues. Okay. So I'm just going to read through the report. Uh, the report here is, Q, is year five, Q, uh, Q2 to Q3. So usually we report these quarterly. In this case, we haven't had an opportunity to report to committee due to elections. So we've included multiple quarters. Um, first off, I just want to highlight that the levy year runs differently from the financial year. So it runs from the November 1st to October 31st. So it's different to our financial year. Um, first, I'll just review the income. So 
We've started to resume normal collections post pandemic and we're seeing an increase in revenue when compared to year four. Um, the total receipts in year five amounted to 251, 716 K. Um, there is a balance carried over from the previous years of 146 K. Um, and there are approximately about 490 thousand that is still outstanding to be collected from previous years that is due to the period within the pandemic that we paused collections um, so i'll just go through the expenditure okay so In the table 2.1, you can see a breakdown of the expenditure. The first three lines represent the annual expenditure for the administration of the levy, salaries, and our enforcement service. These are taken at the end of each financial year. So we have, uh, following that, we have the medical team costs for a four month period, and that amounts to about 14K. The police spend from July to April is 144, 376,000 pounds. Um, there's always quite a large delay between the moment where we get invoiced. So um, the, the dates of provision often vary between the dates that were invoiced. Um, and usually the agreements that we have in place run from anywhere from six months to 12 months. Um, so a lot of the final conferred spends for um, activity during this year will be invoiced in year six. We also had the renewal, the renewal of the data packages for a three-year period for the four redeployable cameras. Um, so we, in previous years, purchased four cameras, CCTV cameras that can be moved around the borough. Um, and these are to assist in nighttime economy areas where the coverage is minimal. Um, and then we also had we also had the MMV that was out on Jubilee weekend. We have the, and then we have print design costs, recruitment costs, and training costs. So apologies. Okay, so um, as part of the manifesto commitments, um, the Hackney Nights team will work with licensed premises to ensure that nighttime spaces are well managed, informed and inclusive, and that they contribute to the long-term success of the town centers and neighborhoods. Um, we can basically divide the work under Hackney Nights in three sections. The first one being crime prevention and engagement. Um, so prevention is a big part of the work we do. So a lot of that focuses on venue training and looks at areas like welfare, vulnerability, gender-based violence. We do a lot of work with LGBTQI plus venues. Um, we also do bespoke venue training in multiple areas um, that I do on site personally with each venue. Um, also part of that package is the counterterrorism training we do for frontline staff and licensing, basic licensing training. We always attend local forums. Um, we do site visits and pub watches, and we've uh, acquired a new support officer who is um, helping the late night levy team to go out to businesses and knock on doors, essentially boosting the portal enrollments and boosting, um, boosting adhering to our training programs. Um, we also hosted a night on the 19th of July called An Evening for a Nighttime Economy, which marked um, the launch of the Hackney Nights accreditation scheme to the businesses across the borough. So the accreditation scheme is something that's new for Hackney Nights, something that's come in this year, um, essentially. And it essentially asks the venues to complete a set of criteria across many areas. So accredited venues have to be inclusive. They must have a zero tolerance to hate and discrimination. They have to be safe. They have to operate with robust crime prevention policies. They have to be involved, play a part in their local communities, um, be sustainable, reducing waste and adopting other sustainable policies, being respectful, managing noise and nuisance to, to neighbors properly, being healthy, um, and being educated, so taking part in all of the training programs and workshops that we do. Um, 
Accredited venues are also part of our greater recovery pa uh, plan from the pandemic and benefiting from a 30% reduction on the late night levy fees. Um, and we've actually uh, given, the mayor has actually awarded the five first accredited venues across the borough, which are Oslo, Blondies, Mascara Bar, Village Underground, and Earth. So congratulations to those venues. Um, so this is going to be part of a lot of the focus over the next couple of months as we launch this to the wider public. Um, we will be doing a lot of work educating the public on what these venue, what it means to be an accredited venue and that these venues are aligned with Hackney values. Um, I'll go on to the second area of work, which is enforcement and welfare. So uh, within that strand, there are four basic categories. So we can divide that into police enforcement, uh, local hackney enforcement officers, CCTV, and our local medical team. So we continue to fund one inspector, four sergeants, and 24 police constables across the borough in nighttime economy areas. They have been contracted on Fridays and Saturdays until 6 a.m. Um, there's been a slight change in the policing plan over the course of the year as we welcome the new Shoreditch Town Centre team, which is not funded by the levy, but that uh, works alongside it. Um, and, it all, and we've also managed to attract more local officers to work our nighttime economy as opposed to officers being in across the city. Um, the, the Hackney Nights policing plan focuses mainly around reducing vulnerability, violence, especially against women and girls, thefts and robbery, substance misuse and nitrous oxide. In April 2022, we introduced the medical team to Shoreditch. So that consists of two, two medically trained staff and a vehicle, um, and they provide medical as assistance, spot vulnerability, as well as help with issues such as drink spiking or sexual offenses or harassment. They are all connected to CCTV, police, enforcement officers, as well as the businesses via various radio channels. Um, and in the three month pilot period, they have helped over 100 victims or individuals, some of which have had life threatening injuries. They also free up the resources, uh, our police and enforcement resources. So um, instead of waiting for an ambulance for five or six hours, they then can take over that duty of care and enforcement officers and police can go on to focus on other issues. Um, the review of the pilot was presented at the last late night levy board, and it was agreed that the medical assistance shall continue for the next three months and be reevaluated once again at the next board meeting in October. So, so far to date, the expenditure of the medics program has been absorbed into the police allocation um, to utilize the current police underspend. So, um, in regards to CCTV, we've continued to deploy our assets to nighttime economy, nighttime economy areas with little or no coverage, and we've continued to fund enforcement officers to patrol nighttime economy areas and dealing with things such as public urination, littering and antisocial behavior, mostly in the shortage area. We have also funded a dedicated enforcement officer for Dalston. Um, so communication and information sharing is another area that we do uh, want to improve on this year with a really robust communication strategy. Um, we want to ensure that licensees can access the information they need with, uh, within the Hackney Nights portal and also um, push out the number of communications that our team provides. Um, so uh, we do provide meaningful updates as well in all of the major meetings and the late night levy team also sits on the Violence Against Women and Girls Strategic Board. So I think all in all, um, we really do have a robust plan in place in line with the manifesto commitments uh, around Hackney Nights. Um, and we're gonna focus on prevention, education, enforcement, welfare and improving publicity and ramping up our communication strategy in line with 2022 manifesto commitments. Um, so yes, uh, we are in a stable position financially, but I think we do need to ensure we collect all the outstanding fees from previous years, and we will continue to present quarterly updates to this committee uh, moving forward with the final end of year report after October 31st, 2022. So that is the, the bulk of the report. Um, I've, had some, I've had an incident with my battery. It looks like I was, it just went flat all of a sudden from 75%. So 
not sure what's going on with my laptop. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to do the live demo as it stands, unless I, you can, I can use yours. But um, I'm, so apologies about that. So what we're trying to do here is, is do a little kind of live demo of the Hackney Knights portal, um, which I thought would be very useful for people to see. We can have, we can do another session if you can, if you can't manage it today. We can do it again. We can do it another time if you can't do it now. I think so. Um, apologies. So actually, what we've done is we've actually set up all the councillors on committee with access codes to go in and have a look in the portal, and they should be in your inbox as of seven thirty. So you can actually go in. I'm so sorry about this, um, but we can actually do a live demo maybe next next meeting as well if. Members are, are, are up for that. I mean, I think it'd be really useful, frankly, to get onto that site to see what they offer because there's lots of training courses on there. I mean, this is just an example of some of the communications that they use, for example, um, stuff around around Knox, which is a big problem at the moment. Just you know, highlighting little posters that go up. So this is the kind of thing they're doing. So lots of good work on on posters and information for people running around, you know, in the nighttime economy, customers and staff. Um, loads of training on there, um, so it would be good for us to see. So if members are happy, then maybe we could do that next time. If that's, if that's good, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm available in the meantime for any questions. Uh, and then obviously, have. because you've got that link now, everyone on the, on the committee, you can go in yourself and just have a, have a little look. Yeah? Um, great. So any, any questions for Samantha then? I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, Councillor Root. Thanks. Um, first of all, I might be a bit late in this, but I just wanted to congratulate Samantha because I noticed that she's a Hackney star. <laughs> she won an internal award. Um, and I'm not too surprised because I know you work really, really hard. So congratulations on that. Um, I've got quite a few questions, actually. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying, by, by asking a question about this 490K, which is outstanding um, from the non during the pandemic. Are we writing that off? Are we going to try and collect it? What are we doing with that? What's the situation? Yes, so we do have to start resuming collections. We have a statutory duty to collect these. Um, so we do need to resume and uh, there are some in some cases that they are astounding amounts for the time that, during the pandemic where we did decide during uh, previously to stop collections to kind of give some breathing room to licensed premises in light of obviously all the financial difficulties they had. We did lobby central government to try and uh, with other councils to try and get an exemption for the time that they were not operating, but unfortunately not, that hasn't been addressed by central government. So until that, that is done, we, can, we have to essentially collect all the outstanding amounts. So that represents, in some cases, more than one year of levy payments. I, I don't know what the rules and regs are with regard to uh, collecting this money, but I guess I would make a plea at this point, given the cost of living crisis, and in particular, local businesses are struggling with their fuel bills in coming months, for us to find payment plans which are as flexible as possible for those premises which are in arrears with their payments, basically. I don't know how much flexibility you've got for that. Yeah, I think we've always been really pragmatic in the collections, and we're obviously aware of the financial stresses of all the businesses. Um, so we are, I don't know, David, if you want to come in on, on that specifically, but yeah, I think we are, you know, trying to be as pragmatic as possible while still, you know, fulfilling our statutory duties. Yeah, so I, I, I guess we would carry on being as flexible as we were um, during, the, during the pandemic. So uh, just giving operators more time to, to pay or uh, break down their payments into smaller chunks, et cetera, that's, that sort of thing. Um, but ultimately, as Samantha says, we, uh, where, where a license exists, there is a requirement for that, that license holder to, to pay the, 
the annual fee and the, the late light levy on the anniversary. So, um, but as I say, we'll, we'll give people more time to pay if they need. To. Yeah, I mean, so annually, I just want to give some context to the fees themselves because um, annually they represent on average about £1,000 annually for a premises on average, I'm saying, but obviously it all depends on their band. So, and how, how, um, what, what, where they sit, where they're situated in the band, in the band. So, yes, um, it's about, yeah, a little less than a hundred a month, I suppose, if you were going to break it down. But we, we do ask for this annually based on the date of their license. But am I right in saying the collection rates have gone up, that they're kind of slowly creeping up so that they are, they're, you know, they're, they're getting the money in now, which is good. Can I? Uh, Jana Thomas. Th thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Root. Can I just make a, just to add to what both uh, David and Sam have said? Uh, they've been very good in terms of giving the premises leeway around collection and giving them the breeding spaces to do that. While I appreciate what you just said around uh, uh, plan for them to pay, it is important for us to acknowledge you've seen the expenditures that within that levy, that's where some yeah, salary come from, the uh, monitoring and enforcement around policing in the nighttime economy, that's where those funds come from. So it is important for us in terms of managing nighttime economy, in terms of being able to have both Sam and Miguel with us doing this work, you just say, uh, giving them compliment for those uh, levy need to be paid. Sorry, I'm going to hog the limelight for a minute because I do have a couple of other questions. Um, one is, I suppose, since we are going to get this money in at some point into the into the future, I was just wondering about what we might be looking at spending it on, um, because presumably we will have a bit of capital there to invest. Um, two thoughts, really. One is the um, redeployable cameras, which I think are probably quite useful. Um, and Jerry might be able to clarify this, but I was told by someone recently that one of those is out of action at the moment. So I wondered if we might be, is it, is it feasible for us to think about spending some of this money on fixing it or getting extra ones? Because they do seem to be very useful. And the other thing I just wanted to mention, which again is possibly more uh, a question for the law enforcement and, and the, and the uh, uh, protection officers really is, is around, um, we talk a lot about Shoreditch and you know, we're obviously very appreciative of the fact that the police have put more officers into Shoreditch, which is very helpful. But um, the top end of Dalston, um, I'm a bit worried is getting a little bit left behind. And in particular, that bit around the area where Shacklewell Lane and the Crossway cross over, because the Dalston enforcement, I think, tends to focus around Gillett Square. And I do know from residents in, in that sort of slightly upper end towards Stoke Newington that um, they often feel that the night, nighttime levy that their businesses are paying that, but they're not getting the, the same kind of input as some other areas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something we always have provided a resource to Dalston. So our Hackney Night serials are tasked to Dalston. They're also, we also have dedicated enforcement that we task to Dalston. Um, and we have also expanded, obviously shortage has its priorities, but we have also just recently expanded the medics because primarily the pilot was in shortage for the three month period. And now we've actually extended it up to other areas. So as far as Stoke Newington, Hackney Wicks, Hackney Central and Dalston. So that we, we really kind of try and concentrate as much as possible in all areas. Obviously, police resources will focus primarily where they're needed, but that is always part of our, our thought and planning processes is to include the other areas because there are five areas that we look at. So we do always, when we're trying to kind of task our resources, always look at this, at what the needs are and try and kind of 
you know, cover it as much we, as much as we can in the most kind of uh, proportionate manner, really. Any other questions? Fonda if Jerry had any thoughts about the the, re the movable cameras. Thank you, Klaus. I don't know about the camera, but you asked a question about the income and could it be spent on other things? So we are limited in what we can spend the income on because 70% of it is to go towards policing, 30% to local authority. So of whatever we get in, only 30% of that is expendable by the local authority. The rest goes towards policing. But I will check the camera and we'll come back to you. Thank you for that, Mr. McCarthy. Um, any further questions at all? Councillor Garbett, uh, Councillor Ross, Councillor Ross, for you first, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, I had, a, um, I've got a couple of questions actually. One of them is about the accreditation scheme. I was wondering whether um, the thirty percent reduction that you're offering is that likely to have a significant impact on income then? Um, we can only go on examples from other boroughs really and in the in the examples of other similar schemes we've seen take up at about 10 percent so i would expect that to be about in line with what we're going to see moving forward um, i would say that you know of that 30 percent so it's approximately you know on average about 300 pounds savings per premises um, and we have 400 and 415, 420 late night levy premises. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can I just ask another question, which was um, about the training that you offer as well. Um, it seems that you have training as part of the accreditation scheme, which seems to be mandatory, if I'm understanding correctly. And then for those that aren't part of the scheme, it's it's not compulsory they can choose to opt in to that training um so my first question really is about the the well, all premises is there a way to kind of make certain important topics mandatory for all premises to attend such as training on domestic abuse and anything that's re relating to safeguarding issues first of all um and then i also want to know uh whether, well, actually how you ensure the, those premises that are part of the scheme are kind of uh, meeting the criteria of basically being inclusive and safe and all of that. In regards to those, obviously making the trainings mandatory for all, uh, are, there's quite a lot of limitations there. Unfortunately, the power of engagement and influence are probably the only um real tools we have here to ensure that they do the training apart from any sort of licensing um conditions that is would be a separate way but that would only be triggered by you know uh in the case of new application or you know variations so there's no blanket way to to um get them to all have this as a mandatory requirement but we do i can say that we do engage with them regularly and there is the take-up is quite good to be honest with you um i i would say that the the bigger venues especially have been really really kind of engaging with us on a regular basis we have about 150 large premises that have already had staff trained on this multiple times we do the monthly free training sessions for everyone without any cost, any licensed premises, not just late night levy. And yeah, I mean, they're quite successful. Attendance is really good and there is a take up, but obviously with the nature of the hospitality industry, this is something that we will need to drive forward with continuous engagements. Hence why we've, uh, why we brought Miguel in the support officer so that he can be my, you know, going and knocking on doors and ensuring that people know about these programs. Yeah, Samantha, maybe you want to mention pub watch as well, because that's kind of like a that's a sort of uh, where the pubs share kind of you know good information and good practice with each other. 
Yeah, so we currently have four pub watch groups. So there's one for Dalston, one for Shoreditch, one for Hackney Central, London Fields, and then another for Stokington. So we are always attending these meetings on a monthly basis. We talk about these trainings. We also kind of give mini trainings as well during the meetings, like just raising awareness about certain things, tips and tricks, things like that. So, you know, we, we try and constantly be in front of them with this Consulum, so we, we, we've now just started sending out a newsletter quarterly, which advises them of all the upcoming trainings, you know, other things they need to be aware of. Um, so that's, that's really helped, um, that's really helped engagement as well. And thank you, Councillor Ross, for those questions. I think they're really good questions. And I think, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think the, the more we can reach venues out there, the better with these training programs and information, the better. Um, so maybe that's something we can take away and think about. But that's a really great question. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Garbutt. Thank you. I just want to add my, yeah, thanks to the brilliant work of the team. And I know we've, I've seen you at the Dalston Pub Watch and also, yeah, we just had a quick chat before. But I just, so yeah, a couple of maybe clarity questions. Just, just us speaking then about the Hackney Knights accreditation and the arrears. Will they be able to apply for Hackney Knights accreditation if they've got arrears? Just a question. Um, and then another one is, I know you've talked about your relationship with the businesses, but I just wondered if you could talk a bit about what consultation happens in how the late night levy is, just, like what's decided it's spent on. Because I can see from the minutes that it reflects what businesses are talking about. But just, yeah, if you could talk a bit about if residents are able to also raise what they want to see in it. So. Sure. Um, in terms of, uh, well, the late, first off, I just want to explain the governance of the board. So we have a late night levy board that meets quarterly, and that includes business representatives, the police, councillors, uh, myself, and the Hackney Knights and licensing teams. Um, and we basically, at that board, will put together proposals and we'll discuss what, how the money will be allocated. So it's a, it's a, dis, it's a group decision model. Um, and we all kind of uh, provide feedback on proposals brought to the table by other members. And we, we decide as a group, as a team, really, what, what we should move forward with in terms of proposals. Yeah. Oh. First one was just to clarify, if they're in arrears, can they apply for the Hackney Knights accreditation? Yes, yeah, so they can still apply whether they have arrears or not. It's the, so it's an annual basis, so the reduction is only applicable on the year they apply and they have to redo their accreditation process annually to keep receiving the 30 percent reduction because the scheme will evolve with time so we want them to re-engage with us on an annual basis that's great and councillor sizer Thank you. Um, yeah, just again to say a huge thank you for all the work. Um, uh, my area is Shoreditch, and so it's just wonderful to hear about some of the work happening there. Um, you mentioned as a throwaway that, that the two medics have been expanded into other areas. Just wanted to hear a little bit more about that and whether Shoreditch um, long term could see um, some more medics involved as well. It seems a really long term cost effective investments i'm sure there's a short-term uh monetary um investment but actually long term it feels like something that really would pay off so it'd be great to hear if the the, the scheme could be expanded yes yeah, so it's it's so we did trial it for specifically in shortage for three months and then what it what we've done is we've so all of our enforcement officers police and the medics team they're all connected via the radio system so actually what happens in real life is that they're called to different incidents and then they'll obviously do a prior, they'll prioritize based on, you know, severity and where they're needed most. But they, they're, they're always available to everyone essentially in the borough if they're needed. But obviously they can't be everywhere at once, so they have to prioritize. Um, but I, we would love to see them be a permanent uh, uh, asset to uh, the deployments down there. It will be highly dependent. I'll just be upfront committee it'll be highly dependent on whether we see this income come in or not so um right now they're being absorbed by the majority of the by the um shortfall in the police budget but uh, with the money being a bit tight you know we have to reevaluate every three months at the current time so 
the income will really dictate whether we keep them on permanently. Yeah, yes, so we're constantly trying to get further funding through, you know, alternative revenue sources like Safer Streets funding or additional home office funding. So we are making bids to kind of help and fund some of these additional resources. Um, it's something that we are continuously looking into as they become available. Fantastic. And yeah, we, we can definitely reassure you that, that we are well behind the, the medics. I think it's a f fantastic scheme. I mean, everybody in the Lake Light Le Levy Board supports it 100%, so we'll be definitely pushing that as much as we can. Um, but uh, I was going to say, um, yeah, I've got a question just around about the um, income. Um, just to clarify, and I've probably asked this question before in, in, in another committee meeting some other day. Um, just on the overtime, so page 31, it's provision of overtime. So I'm just trying to understand, we pay for the police, um, but not always on overtime rates, right? So what, what is this referring to, these overtime rates? I just want to get to the bottom of that. So yes, yeah, so we don't, not all the police time we fund is overtime, but it's called, well, it's an overtime agreement. So it's for hours worked outside of their normal kind of dedicated hours. So let's say, for instance, I'll give you an example, local ward officer who has his core hours, who's working, you know, perhaps a different schedule, will come in on a Friday or on a Saturday and work an extra, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours to help with the nighttime economy. And that, it, that funding comes directly from us. Um, so yeah, we are on a we are on an overtime model, um, but sometimes the hours will will count towards the core hours. It, de it depends, you know, on that specific officer. So yeah. Great, thank you for that. Uh, any further questions at all? I mean, I would just like to say at this point that we did have a walkabout uh, one night uh, down there, and I would invite all members to take part in any future. Uh, I mean, what I mean is go down to Shoreditch and be with the police and the whole team and just walk around and see what happens. It's a really good learning experience to see, and you'll see the medics at work, you'll see the police at work, you'll see how they engage with the venues, you'll see all the activity, and you'll see what the police have to do, and they've got a tough job. Um, so I would really invite any of you, when you get the opportunity, if it arises, to go on one of those. And I mean, I'll be going again. Uh, I only lasted until midnight last time, but um, this time I would plan, because I had, had to go away the next day, um, I plan to do until five in the morning next time. So I plan to go through the whole night, um, but it was really good. So thank you for that. And uh, Jerry McCarthy was on it and Susan was on it and we all had a, you know, a, great, a great learning experience. So please think about that. So I think because there's no more questions, um, we'll move on now just to note the contents and the, and the verbal uh, report there, if that's okay, if you'd just like to note all of that. Fantastic, great, thank you. Um, and then we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, um, which is item six. So it's a late night levy governance structure in terms of reference. Um, so I'm hoping that you've all managed to read that. Um, and you obviously do have an opportunity now to raise anything around that if you wish. But otherwise, I'm making the assumption that you've read it and that you're all content. Um, am I right? I'm not seeing anybody. Councillor Garbutt. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, on the whole, obviously supportive of the structure, but I just think it just be to clarify the point I made earlier about the outcomes. So in the key documents where it says licensing reports, it would just be good to also include the out outcomes. You know, I was saying about refusals or not, so to, get, to have that regularly just included in reports. Um, yeah, and you answer one of my earlier questions, which is about how businesses and residents are kind of represented in their views. Uh, um, Included, yeah. Sensing the changes when, uh, because like what Councillor Gabet said, we have a business representative on the meeting and it gets to a stage, it, it has followed the same format since 2017. 
and in the meeting in February, we were looking to way of changing that to give the uh, business rep the opportunity to ask questions more from both the council and police partners. So it's just making that more interactive in terms of the format of the meeting, which we try out the last one, which everyone, including myself and business rep, were very happy about the new uh, uh, structure. So thanks again, uh, Jerry and Sam. The, the only thing in the, in the late night levy board, you know, just for consistency sake, Sam, in the other ones you've put here by the director of climate, here by the head of community safety, you cannot share by the head of community safety to that as well. Just for clarity. Okay, noted. Thanks. It's great, and thank you, Councillor Fajana Thomas, for, for that clarification. It's quite useful. Um, anybody got any more comments to make about this? This is your last chance, everyone. Last chance to make any comments. Can't see anyone. Oh, uh, Councillor. Sheila, Suzu, is it Renge, Rungu? No, that's completely not the, 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 the name that I have, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Um, it's just to note that the Mayor of London's report on licensing in May 2022 commended uh, London Borough Hackney Service on two initiatives. One, the Open Markets app, and two, the Hackney Nights portal. And both of these were commended because they're open-ended platforms, they have a training element and they are adaptable. And I think that this proactive approach um, is not only beneficial to licensees and to applicants, but also to the community impact, which is quite relevant as an outcome for particularly Shoreditch and Dalston. So I just wanted to um, Bring that forward and let us note this commendation, which is down to the hard work of the cabinet and um, the uh, LBH officers. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. Yeah, well done, everyone. Um, so if we can just note the terms of reference, that everyone's content, fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll move on to uh, item agenda number seven. So this is the uh, oral update from legal and governance. So over to Amanda, thank you. Uh, good evening, members. Um, Basically, uh, the current situation is that we have um, a number of appeals at different stages um, currently um, at the Magistrates Court following decisions that were made. Um, in, uh, on the 14th of, November, 14th of June, sorry, um, we had one licensing appeal which uh, was dismissed and the Council was successful in, the, in um, having the, um, their decision upheld. And that's in the case of um, the Ye Old Axe. Um, 69 Hackney Road, which was um, which had the um, alcohol license taken, um, and the council were also successful in getting 90% of their costs uh, for that. Um, uh, they're not. Um, you'll know that they were uh, previously uh, a sex establishment, and they're not also operating that at the moment. Um, and um, we have been. Um, trying where possible to settle um, as many p appeals as where as possible as where we can um, in uh, conjunction with negotiations with the police and um, any other um, responsible authorities um, by agreeing conditions um, agreeing um, amended hours um, and uh, where possible also um, consulting with local residents to make sure that they've had some input into it 
Um, it's not been an easy uh, process. It's been quite long. Um, but we are trying to work through that um, and we are currently working with the police to um, try and avoid having to take too many uh, cases to a full hearing uh, to incur unnecessary costs. Um, at the moment we have um, about six appeals um, in court and we have had some recent refusals. Um, they are likely to um, appeal those decisions but it will obviously depend on their grounds of appeal as to whether or not we will go to full hearing or not. Um, the licensing service, uh, David and, um, and Jerry, uh, they do ca uh, carefully consider all the grounds and what can be done to overcome the situation. Um, in, in some cases, for example, um, I'm going tomorrow to court to finalise a consent order on the um, British Express um, premises. And that was based on a period of um, observing their CCTV, trying uh, the police working with them and trying to ensure that they're operating responsibly to, um, so that going forward, um, they don't uh, have to lose their license, but they can um, overcome the difficulties by following the advice given. And that seems to have worked. Uh, they're now operating very well and they were able to agree um, mostly core hours and only three um, evenings from Thursday, Friday and Saturday until 2 a.m., which is a sort of compromise um, to, to allow them the opportunity to um, trade and have some, um, some opportunity to, um, to benefit from the nighttime trade. Uh, I don't have any further information unless, uh, David, can you think of anything else I've omitted um, to say? Uh, no, I think you've covered everything, Amanda. I think you've covered everything. Thank you, Thank you Memphis. Thank you. Any questions, anyone, for Amanda at all there? I mean, I would just like to, to ask, is, is six appeals, is that, is that normal? Um, all, all decisions that are made by the licensing subcommittee, um, the, the parties are entitled to um, appeal those decisions. Um, it may sometimes be that it's not the full decision, it might just be a condition or something. But in these instances, they have been the actual full decision where they've uh, not been happy with the decision that was made based on the fact that they weren't happy with the findings um, which were established in the meeting. Um, so it, it's a matter for them to um, demonstrate that they can, um, they have got justifiable reasons to appeal their decision and to have it heard as a rehearing. Um, so, for example, we've got one appeal where um, a refusal was given to the decision for an um, application for a, um, an alcohol license. They weren't able to prove that they could operate as a responsible um, operator. They lodged their appeal with no actual grounds of appeal submitted to us. But they then came back and said, can we agree conditions? What was the purpose of their um, appeal is, is really the question that we're now trying to establish. So we can't, we don't just agree um, to settle cases or um, any other options just randomly. They, they do have to be um, strongly um, considered. And also we have to go through consultation with local residents, the police, um, to ensure that um, the right decision is made. Uh, we, every decision, um, the parties are entitled to appeal after 21 days. So it is, um, it is a large number of appeals, but I think that we are working through them and we're not actually going to full hearing um, this, uh, as, with as many of them this year as we did last year. But we were successful in all of our appeals last year and so far this year. So that is the important point, is that we're making strong and robust decisions uh, and carefully considering the points. That's why when we make decisions, we always ask members, please make sure you have good and justified reasons for making your decision. We don't just automatically predetermine decisions and I think that's really important that you are listening to the evidence that's put before you. Is it justified? Is it strong enough? Is that a reasonable reason to refuse? 
if there isn't enough information or evidence there to refuse a decision, then you can't refuse it. You have to try and um, grant the license, but maybe with conditions and other factors um, agreed with the applicant to ensure that they are monitoring and controlling all aspects of their process and procedures. And, and that's what we have to keep doing. Um, thank you members as well for the time that you take to uh, hear these um, applications. I know it's not been easy. Everyone thinks um, it's the summer holidays uh, that we all have a break, but actually in licensing we all know that August, July, August and September are the busiest months, excluding all the holidays that occur. So. Um, Thank you to everyone who took the time to um, sit on those um, various um, uh, licensing subcommittees because it is really important to us. Um, thank you for your time. I suppose, I suppose, Amanda, what I was trying to say there with that question is, are there any learnings for the committee, um, really, uh, I suppose? Are we getting it right? That's the point. So far, I don't have any specific um, criticism. Um, of the decisions that have made or anything that we've um, done wrong. The only, um, what sometimes happens is, is that if they've appealed and there's a period of time, so for example, let's say they appealed in March and that we're now in September, in that time they could have actually turned things around. So that's nothing to do with the actual decision that you've made, but that's actually part of the appeal process because the appeal is a rehearing of that application again. It's, it's a hearing de novo, it's called, which means it's a, it's a rehearing that the magistrates will listen to the and the, or the district judge will listen to the case again and they will decide whether or not the council will write in the decision they were making. So far, we haven't lost an appeal and sometimes when we make the decision to um, settle by way of consent order that's possibly an indicator where we feel we don't have enough evidence there to successfully win it or they've made a transformation in that period of time so for example in six months they may have turned themselves around they've um, done everything they can then if we go to appeal what are we actually asking them to change what more can they do we can't ask them to do more if they've already done it so um, that's why that there's always the scope for trying to settle, if we can, to encourage operators to be responsible and to take the appropriate action. So uh, if, if there is any learning points, I will definitely pass those on to you, but I don't have anything at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I mean, I feel personally really uh, reassured by uh, having Amanda there in the subcommittee meeting. She's fantastic lawyer, governance and stuff. It's great to have you on board. Um, gives us a lot of confidence because we are aspiring to be the best licensing team in the country, aren't we? Um, so, you know, having Amanda there and, and Sam and Jerry and, and Kasofjana Thomas and all these wonderful people, you know, that's what we're going to do. Um, so let's move on to uh, the final item on the agenda, item eight, um, which is any other urgent business. Um, unless, of course, you've got any further questions for Amanda. But thank you, Amanda, for that report. And if you'd just like to note what Amanda said, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so any other urgent business at all? If there isn't, I can declare the meeting closed. And thank you very much for attending, everyone. But don't, don't go anywhere. Um, 